Some plants change medicine, some change belief. This one changed everything we eat and may be the key to unlocking a cure for cancer. I'm Megan Brame, and on this episode of The History of Plants, we're diving into Piper nigrum, the black pepper vine. From ancient Egyptian tombs to European royal feasts, black pepper turned flavor into power and appetite into empire. And like so many great stories, it started with one question. When do you know you've got something in your hand that changes the course of history? And what do you do with it? Long before ships crossed oceans for it, black pepper was just a forest vine clinging to trees in southern India. In the steaming lowlands of the western Ghats, where monsoon rain feeds red soil and filtered sun, Piper nigrum learned to climb. It belongs to the Piper Icee family and actually has no relation to other peppers like jalapenos or bells. However, it does share lineage with the common houseplant Peperomia. One branch became decoration, the other rewired global trade. Um, I'll let you guess which one is which. By around 2000 BCE, farmers along Kerala's coast had begun cultivating the vine deliberately, training it up from guardian trees in the serpentine style that's still used today. In Sanskrit texts, it appears as maricha. Within Ayurveda, pepper symbolized internal fire, and combining it with long pepper and ginger created what's known as trikadu, a three-spice blend meant to stoke digestion and purify breath. Those early harvests transformed a forest vine into a kind of sacred culinary chemistry. Pepper-flavored ritual offerings preserved food through humidity and stood for prosperity under the goddess Lakshmi. As the coastal kingdoms of southern India prospered, pepper began to move. The first famous exporting point is the now lost city of Musiris, which we believe was somewhere near the southwestern tip of India. From there, Arab and Persian merchants would sail with their bounties of pepper and head west. Like I mentioned in the cinnamon episode, these merchants controlled every port between India and the Mediterranean, and they understood simple math of appetite. The less people knew, the more they'd pay. Pepper became a luxury precisely because no one knew where it came from. By around 1500 BCE, these shrewd merchants were carrying it north and west through Mesopotamia to Egypt. To the wealthy in Babylon, Thebes, and Athens, each grain was something precious that gave you standing as long as you could afford it. Interestingly, once pepper reached these ancient trading posts, its trail fades. The only real clue we have about how it was used back then comes from 1881, when archaeologists unwrapped the mummy of Pharaoh Ramses II, who had been dead for nearly 3,000 years. Inside, they found whole peppercorns packed into his nostrils for embalming, with sealed jars of the spice beside him. After that, the record falls silent until about the 4th century BCE, and that's when we start to see pepper, known as papyri, begin appearing in Greek markets. After Rome conquered Egypt, its merchants Merchants gained access to Red Sea ports like Berenike and Myos Hormos, which were gateways that Arab and Indian sailors had used for generations. With these harbors under Roman control, the Greek papyri became the Latin piper, and pepper ships from the Malabar coast could now sail straight into the empire's economy. We found a first century cookbook that contains piper in multiple recipes, which is pretty cool. I wonder if anybody has replicated those recipes today. I'm not a very good cook, so I don't know. But not everyone was so enthused with this new spice. Pliny the Elder was scandalized, complaining that India drained the empire of 50 million sesterces annually for the sake of a flavor. He even listed the going rate, 4 denarii per pound for black pepper, 7 for white, 15 for long. His moral outrage only proved how addicted Rome had become. And hey, if you like the kind of history that shows you how small things shaped everything, hit subscribe because that's what Plantrums is all about. Archaeology now traces that craving across the empire. Mineralized peppercorn survived in the sewers of Herculaneum, preserved by volcanic ash. Others have turned up in the legionary camp at Oberod in Germany, in cremations and refuse from Roman London, and in a writing tablet from Vindulanda along Hadrian's Wall, where a soldier recorded buying pepper for his rations. Further east, in Mursa, modern-day Croatia, archaeologists uncovered two carbonized peppercorns mixed with grains of imported rice inside a 2nd-century septic pit. By then, pepper was no longer the indulgence of the nobles, but the backbones of international trade. Arab and Indian ships loaded with it dominated Red Sea routes. Greeks and Roman merchants filled theirs in return with gold, glass, and wine. It also became a valuable tool for efficiency, or, depending on your view, corruption. You see, 
the Roman state taxed every shipment that passed through Alexandria. Even back then, there was a sea of paperwork to be done because every manifest needed to be stamped and recorded. So merchants would occasionally request an expedited process for the right price. And with a shipload of peppercorns, I said shipload, money was no object. It was the kind of system where bribing the recorder was just the cost of doing business. But when you've got a ship full of perishable goods that you need to move, time is of the essence. In every market it touched, Pepper blurred the line between necessity and indulgence. When the Western Roman Empire finally fell in the 5th century, its taste didn't. Pepper had already conquered Europe's imagination. It would outlive empires, ignite exploration, and turn desire itself into economy. Pepper didn't disappear with Roman legions. It outlived them appearing in nearly every market from Alexandria to Venice. For a thousand years, Europe's fervor for that heat shaped economies, language, and art. By the 11th century, Venice had transformed that hunger into an empire. Every sack of pepper that entered Europe passed through its docks. Venetian officials fixed prices by season, manipulating supply and demand. A single pound could buy a sheep. A chest could buy influence. To eat peppered meat was to dine with power itself. Venetian merchants called it black gold, They used pepper as collateral for loans, pledged it as dowry, and insured it through early banking houses that would later evolve into the Medici system. Whole fortunes were built on the promise of a few sacks landing safely in port. So when plague or piracy interrupted supply, pepper prices spiked, much like the tulip mania that we see later on. And that craving left fingerprints in language and law. Peppercorn rent appeared in charters as a symbolic payment, proof that even a single grain could clear a debt. Guild ledgers recorded it besides silver and silk. Pepper became a social performance, a symbol of refinement and reach. The wealthy flaunted it at feasts in carved grinders and silver vessels like the Hoxon Empress Pepper Pot, which is a 4th century treasure from Roman Britain, shaped as a regal woman with her gilded hair and jeweled robes, hiding a rotating disc that dispensed the spice. It was a luxury so extravagant that it turned dinner into theater, even as the empire around her collapsed. In China, it appeared as Wei Hao, foreign pepper, a delicacy of the Tang elite that became so popular it sometimes replaced the native Sichuan. Marco Polo's writings from the 13th century talk of when the Great Khan's custom officers claimed the city of Wangshao. They alone consumed 43 loads of it a day, which was the equivalent of nearly 10 tons. So 10 tons of pepper a day. Wow. Across Europe, pepper became the mark of refinement. Medieval cookbooks like La Viandier and the form of curry treated it as a sacred garnish, like having a little black poof of wealth. Even Buddhist monastic code listed it among the few medicines monks were allowed to carry. But Venice's monopoly couldn't last. As Northern Europe clawed its way into the age of exploration, new empires wanted direct access to the source. Portugal, lean and ambitious, went south. In 1498, Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope and reached Calicut, modern Cose Cotei, the beating heart of pepper country. His ship returned to Lisbon with a cargo worth 60 times the expedition's cost. The age of discovery had officially become the age of commerce. After that, the Portuguese fortified coastal cities, seized trade routes, and taxed local merchants into poverty. They claimed to be spreading faith, but what they really were spreading were paperwork and tariffs. A century later, the Dutch East India Company, known as the VOC, industrialized conquest. They also called it trade, but it sure did look a lot like war. In 1621, the VOC stormed the Banda Islands, massacring or enslaving nearly the entire population to secure control of the spice trade. They even minted a new kind of wealth, the stock certificate. Pepper became not just a commodity, but an investment. England joined late, but learned fast. The British East India Company built its empire on ledgers and loopholes, measuring pepper in tons and taxing it by the grain. In London's dockyards, you could smell globalization before you could define it. Art recorded the obsession. Medieval manuscripts illustrated pepper harvests as mythic scenes of abundance. Portuguese prints from 1572 depicted Cochi spice ports like cathedrals of commerce. Centuries later, naturalists like William Rind and John Stevenson painted Piper Nigrum as the emblem of botanical conquest, with its curling vines symbolizing both nature's beauty and humanity's greed. By the 18th century, Pepper's grip on civilization was complete. It had bankrolled navies, 
toppled monarchs and flavored everything from royal feasts to peasant stews. It was a currency, it was a craving, and uncomfortably, it was a cause of empire. But the world was changing. Enlightenment chemists were beginning to ask new questions about what made substances taste, smell, and burn. And in those small, hard seeds that had rewritten the world's economy, they found a clue. Inside every peppercorn is a molecule that rewired human appetite, piperine. It's an alkaloid that gives black pepper its bite, not less sharp burn like chili, but like a slow-building warmth that lingers. Of course, it wasn't made to please us. Piperine lives mostly in the fruit's outer layer, alongside other volatile oils that create the spice's earthy, woody scent. Savonine, pinene, limonene, linalool. When ground, they release that unmistakable aroma that's somehow both comforting and dangerous. Piperine binds to TRPV1 receptors in the mouth, the same pain sensors triggered by heat, and tricks your nervous system into thinking it's on fire. It's not flavor in like the traditional sense, it's more confusion turned into pleasurable sensation. And like all good confusions, it's addictive. Modern research shows that piperine boosts the body's absorption of other nutrients, especially curcumin from turmeric, by up to 2,000%. Ayurveda knew this thousands of years ago. The blend that we talked about before, Trikatu, pepper, long pepper, and ginger, was prescribed to light the internal flame, balancing digestion and spirit. Science eventually confirmed what healers already understood. Pepper just makes everything else hit harder. And as medicine evolved, that same property made it valuable to chemists. 19th century pharmacologists isolated piperine from crushed peppercorns and noticed its curious effects, mild stimulation, improved metabolism, and a faint numbing of pain. Early physicians experimented with tinctures for indigestion, coughs, and even melancholia. The Danish chemist Hans Ørsted, the scientist who had actually discovered electromagnetism, identified piperine's crystalline structure. It became one of the first alkaloids to be studied systematically, joining caffeine, quinine, and morphine, all things we've covered in past episodes. But pepper's chemistry isn't all warmth and wellness. Overdose studies show that high concentrations of piperine could cause dizziness, nausea, or even reproductive toxicity. Later animal tests suggest anti-fertility and anti-spermatogenic effects, a reminder that even the mildest kick to the taste buds can have side effects. Still, Piperine found its way into analgesic and anti-inflammatory research where it showed real promise. 2014 study comparing pure piperine to full piper nigrum extracts confirmed that both could reduce inflammation and pain in lab rats. More recent reviews published in 2000 and 2024 go even deeper. Black pepper extracts appear to induce apoptosis, programmed cell death, in cancer cells. In vitro studies showed that piperine halts growth in breast, colorectal, pancreatic, cervical, and liver cancers. It works by interfering with the tumor's signaling pathways, slowing metastasis, and amplifying the effects of chemotherapy drugs like doxorubicin and paclitaxel. It doesn't cure cancer, to be clear. But, once again, it seems to add just like a little boost just this time helping medicine instead of flavor to work smarter and not harder. Beyond oncology, researchers are still unpacking its antioxidant, antibacterial, and even neuroprotective potential. Piperine reduces oxidative stress, may support memory retention, and modulates serotonin and dopamine levels, tiny molecular reasons why a little spice can lift a mood. Its essential oil, rich in bacariophylline, shows mild anesthetic and anti-asthmatic effects. And in the world of experimental pharmacology, it's being used as a model for drug delivery systems that hitchhike on bioavailability boost. Scientists have discovered that pairing piperine with other compounds, everything from curcumin to antibiotics, can dramatically increase how long these molecules stay active in the bloodstream. It slows liver enzymes that normally break down drugs, essentially giving them a longer half-life and a smoother ride. In the lab, that is gold a natural molecule that doesn't just heal but helps medicine work better, longer, and more efficiently? Yes, please. But (laughs) there's another layer to this story, one that says more about us than the molecule. As far as we know, humans are one of the rare species that seeks out pain as pleasure. Capsaicin, piperine, wasabi's isothiocyanates. Our nervous system read them as danger, yet our brains translate them into delight. 
And that way, the chemistry of pepper is the chemistry of civilization. And it's a constant flirtation between comfort and control and craving for something that burns just enough to remind us we're alive. After World War II, pepper became a symbol of normalcy, of meals returning to the table that had once been rationed. Global shipping made it cheap, stable, and seemingly endless. But in the same decades, scientists began to re-examine what was hiding inside those peppercorns. The spice that once bought kingdoms was now extending patents in pharmaceutical labs. Once worth its weight in gold, it now accounts for nearly 20% of the spice trade, with more than half a million tons moving across oceans every year. Vietnam currently leads global production, while India's telecherry variety remains the gold standard for quality, still prized for its rich oils and complex aroma. And scientists have not stopped studying it. Piperine continues to fascinate researchers as a key to bioavailability and how nutrients or drugs move through the body. Neurologists love to test it as a model compound for understanding pain signaling and metabolism. Pharmacologists treat it like a blueprint for designing smarter, safer molecules. Culturally, pepper never left the stage. In language, it became shorthand for liveliness. People were full of pep, spicing things up, or peppering their speech. In literature, it shifted from imperial trophy to domestic comfort, from Pliny's moral outrage to Lewis Carroll's sneezing cook in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Painters rendered it in still lifes as a quiet emblem of trade. Modern artists from Catherine Abel's Still Life with Peppercorns to minimalist kitchen prints turned it into nostalgia. But Pepper's success has come with costs. The same global appetite that built empires now drives monoculture farming across Kerala and Indonesia. Stripping forests from plantation rows, labor exploitation and adulteration scandals like ground pepper mixed with papaya seeds or dust continue to surface, reminders that its trade hasn't fully escaped its colonial past. Meanwhile, the world that once fought over pepper now debates how to grow it responsibly. Botanists and agro-researchers are experimenting with shade-grown and organic models to repair with centuries of profit stripped away. The vine that conquered the world is still teaching lessons about appetite, how quickly desire can outpace balance. And that's what keeps black pepper relevant. Every grind from the mill is a trace fossil of empire and experiment. I'm Megan Brain. Thank you for joining me on another episode of The History of Plants. Jump into the commentary episode on Patreon for bonus content, or if you're ready to follow this trail of plant medicine even further, check out my episode on Cincona, the tree that gave us quinine, cured malaria, and changed the map of the world. Until next time, greenies, stay curious and don't forget to flourish. <laughs>